Well, now on to part three of the introduction in the radar systems engineering course. Now we're in the middle of looking at radar basics and now we're going to spend a, uh, several minutes looking at a block diagram of a radar and giving you a big picture view of what a radar is and how it works. Okay, here's a block diagram of a radar system and you can see that it's broken up into a number of key components. A transmitter section and then there's a transmit receive switch and uh, the these blue lines show the path of the electromagnetic waves and uh, in transmit uh, let's first just let's just first look at the transmitter the transmit is generally made up of um, you can imagine a large number of boxes but these are the big picture block diagram functionality pieces of functionality in the radar and the first one is the waveform generator where the waveform is generated you know the the sinusoidal waveform but at low uh, that's in the microwave ra region but is of low amplitude and then the signal is sent to a power amplifier which will amplify the signal give it the strength to go out and to detect a target it's very very far away. These amplifiers can have uh, gains of oh four or five orders of magnitude easily. Or you might run a series, this box would represent a series of amplifiers uh, in series, a, a group of them in series, in parallel and in series working together so that the total uh, gain output would be 10 to the fifth uh, or it could be one large amplifier, one, one large tube amplifier. But in any case, there's usually a power amplifier subsystem. And then the, um, the energy goes to this switch, a switching mechanism. And sometimes it's a circulator, sometimes it's a duplexer, sometimes it's, a, it's an actual uh, a transmit receive switch implemented in other ways. But its job is to isolate the powerful transmit signal from the receiver which is going to, in a, we'll see in a minute, is going to want to just listen to the very weak echoes coming back from the target. Uh, in, when we're transmitting the, the signal will go out through the, to the antenna and be given directionality by that antenna which will be the, um, the medium which uh, transfers the energy out to the uh, medium we're propagating out through, usually the atmosphere, of course it could be space if this was a radar on a spacecraft, uh, until the, electro the uh, electromagnetic wave, the microwave energy, uh, hits the target, scatters off the target. The target will have a radar cross-section. We'll go into what that means. and It'll have a characteristic which tells you how big it is to an electromagnetic wave, how much of the electromagnet, how much energy scatters back. And I just, wa um, just want to note that uh, here uh, we're going to be talking about the propagation medium too. Now some of that energy will come back and it will go back into the antenna and the transmitter switch will be, will, as soon as the transmitter stops transmitting it will turn into the receive mode where then the energy will come back and into the receiver section. The receiver will ha have a, an amplifier, to, it's very low noise, to amplify the signal and then to convert it into, di into digital format. Because these days with computers, uh, all the processing of the signal, the separating of the target from background noise and from other targets, that all that processing using the Doppler effect and other techniques will be done in the, in the uh, digital domain. And then the signal will go into uh, the signal processing computer where two functions called pulse compression and Doppler filtering, clutter rejection is the function, uh, will be performed one after the other. And you notice as I talk about these things I'm introducing a lot of words which I haven't w very well defined you're going to see that each one of the lectures following will, co will 
discuss in detail these different subsystems of the radar. Now after the signal has been compressed to give it high resolution, and we'll talk later about what that means, and we've used um, Doppler filtering in the frequency domain to reject uh, unwanted slowly moving targets, targets moving at a velocity that aren't the same as the target. We'll go into uh, a detection. Uh, we want to just note that the noise and the signal are random variables and we want it is, there's a probability associated with the signal having a certain voltage and the noise having a certain voltage. We'll have to go through thresholding. We'll talk about adaptive thresholding techniques and then after we've thresholded and we believe we've got a, a set of detections which are probably targets, we want to estimate the observables we talked about earlier in the lecture, uh, the range, the azimuth, the Doppler, as best we possibly can, and, and we do that in the parameter estimation function, and then we'll go to track the object, and that is to correlate detections from one observation of that area of space with another, a different one, a sequential one, one after the other after the other, so that we can track in time the, uh, the location of the target as it moves in space and also make the best estimate possible of where the uh, object that we're tracking is and then of course send the data to uh, operators who will see on uh, displays the location of the target and its characteristics. And in these days we have very sophisticated digital displays. And also to record the data if, if that's an important function of the radar so that analysts later can look very carefully offline at the data to understand how how well the, t the uh, target was tracked, how well the radar worked, and to tune the radar in whatever means to, so that it's it necessary, so that it's operating optimally. Okay, now let's look at one of the interesting characteristics about radars, and that is their, their wavelength and frequencies. If we look, first of all, at uh, on a logarithmic scale, the wavelength and the frequency of electromagnetic radiation. We see down here that electromagnetic radiation go, uh, extends over many, many, many. Each one of these decades is, uh, each one of these little lines represents an order of magnitude. And so the wavelengths generally can go over from a hundred meters down to a hundredth of an angstrom. So there's just a very large number of, uh, of, of dynamic range to electromagnetic waves. And here we see where light is, visible light, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, x-rays and gamma rays that are very small. And in here is the microwave region. And the microwave region is where most radars operate. Generally wavelengths uh, from about a, mil a millimeter or so at its shortest up to uh, wavelengths as, as high as uh, a meter or so, order of magnitude. But if you think about that for a minute, uh, from a millimeter to 10 meters, excuse me, from a millimeter to a meter, that's three orders of magnitude. And so you can imagine that the power generation uh, techniques, the, re the receiver techniques, the methods of, of uh, transmitting uh, uh, energy along waveguides or coaxial cables is very different at these different, over three orders of magnitude. The technology involved is very different in making an amplifier in the millimeter wave technology than it is up at, uh, although the, the block diagrams might look similar, the technology of implementation, and uh, is very different. And uh, radars also operate, um, s some radars do, so-called over-the-horizon radars, up at uh, up to 10 to 30 meters. So we've got a potential here, uh, four orders of magnitude. 
so that you're going to see that the technologies involved in building the radars and uh, among other things how the electromagnetic energy interacts with the target, how it interacts with the atmosphere will be very different over these different over this very wide dynamic range. Now if we just take the microwave band which goes from about a 1 gigahertz to 12 gigahertz and I just put 12 here arbitrarily the millimeter wave bands you'll see that there are a number 4 millimeter wave bands where there are uh, windows of lower relatively lower attenuation which will allow transmission of electromagnetic radiation. There isn't a lot of absorption from water or oxygen, stuff like that. Um, these, th those bands are up from uh, the order of about, um, well, 16 gigahertz up to, to, uh, to 95 gigahertz. They are further up, but I'm just going to show you on a linear scale here from 1 to the order of 10 megahertz, 10 uh, gigahertz, excuse me. And the space and frequency that is allocated by the International Telecommunications Union for radars are these different half a dozen bands. And they have a special nomenclature. Uh, X band is in this region and it's roughly about 9 gigahertz, 9 to 10 gigahertz. C band is about five and a half gigahertz with a corresponding wavelength of five and a half centimeters. S band 10 centimeters at about three gigahertz. L band 23 centimeters about 1.2 to 1.3 gigahertz. And then UHF and VHF standing for ultra high frequency and very high frequency at approximately uh, this is about uh, 400 and 35 centimeters and then 2 meters for VHF. And these are approximately. So you can see that when you look at them on a linear scale they go from a couple of centimeters to a couple of meters and then we've got the millimeter wave bands way up and then you've got up the high frequency bands from, ten, from, from say 3 meters up to 30 meters that, are, that handle over the horizon radar frequencies. So this points out that, that uh, there's are very, very wide dy uh, dynamic range, not dynamic range, but uh, a, a wide frequency extent and wavelength extent that um, radars operate over. Okay. And we're going to be looking at the, all the different properties at the different wavelengths and frequencies. Now I deliberately put up here X-band, C-band, uh, S-band, L-band, UHF, and VHF and as something if you're if you're going to go through the length of this course you're going to learn sort of like a snap in your head the same way pi is 3.14 22 sevenths as you learned uh, when you were learning algebra and geometry I should say uh, you're going to learn X band you're going to think 3 centimeters about 10 gigahertz same thing S band 10 centimeters uh, 3 gigahertz L band 23 centimeters about 1.25 gigahertz and likewise Okay, now let's move on. Now for each of these frequencies, and by the way, these are the exact ranges that the IEEE has set a standard up that we should call these bands. The IEEE has a standards board and standard 521-2002 all agreed that these frequencies from 3 to 30 megahertz was high frequency from 30 to 300 megahertz was VHF and on down. And I just wanted to point out um, that different areas of the frequency spectrum are used for different functions. And we'll see why that is later. In, in, the, in, in simple words, uh, if when you want to search the important thing is power times aperture, the size of your antenna times the power that you have, that you're transmitting. And it's a lot cheaper to get aperture to build a big antenna than it is to put a lot of very expensive power amplifiers together, you'll see. And so uh, if just what you want to do is to set up one big parabolic dish that will focus the energy in one beam, you're going to want a big antenna to do search. 
if you want in, the antenna you're going to want to make as big as possible because it puts less stress on the power of the radar and we see here two types of antennas a parabolic dish that would track have one beam and a, a phased array radar which will uh, this is one at you both at you this one is at UHF this one uh, transmits at both UHF and VHF simultaneously and this is an, uh, an early warning radar uh, it's in Filingsdale England now you see that they are up at this region of long wavelength okay now if we look at tracking radars they want very fine angular accuracy and the angles is approximately lambda over d in radians uh, and d being the size of the aperture and so you're going to want to help you via lambda for very small angles you want the wavelength small and usually tracking radars are in this regime you have atmospheric attenuation issues that can give you more difficulty here than it's worth moving up to get some of the time but here's the haystack radar at uh, Westford Massachusetts which, which is at X band and the inside it, it's a, I think believe 120 120 foot radome and huge radome if you fly in from uh, to Logan Airport it looks like this giant golf ball on the ground uh, and, and this is a uh, uh, a lens radar that's at C-band, a multiple object tracking radar built by Lockheed Martin and uh, it operates also at C-band so you can see tra these are two typical radars just to show you what they look like this one is much bigger has further range and this one is used to uh, look mostly at aircraft and, and near in targets the, or the order of 100 miles or so now um, next we look at s radars where we want to have your cake and eat it too I say you want to be able to do both search and track and they tend to be in the middle they tend to operate between L band and some of them even at X band if you have certain reasons that you want to go to the to X band to get a high bandwidth among other things and here are three different radars that uh, uh, a rotating uh, frequency uh, rotating uh, radar here and we see a, a, a bunch of uh, it's, a, it's a rotating phased array and it, it, it uses uh, phased array elements and uh, linear ones and it rotates and here we have the Aegis radar system the spy one here's its antenna and it operates on uh, destroyers and cruisers for the Navy and it, uh, it it is the eyes of the fleet it sees within line of sight out the order of uh, uh, well I won't hundreds of the order of the order of magnitude of a hundred miles at least uh, all aircraft flying in to protect the, the US Navy fleet and then the Patriot missile defense system and air, mostly air defense system that was used um, against SCUDs during uh, the first Gulf War and it uses a C-band radar. I, I put these up just to show you that radars that perform functionally both search and track operate from L-band to C-band and even into X-band. Okay now if we're going and we and we want to put a radar on a missile and use that radar as guidance to guide the missile to a target we've got a very small aperture size for the missile and so remember the, the angular size is lambda over D, D being the size of the antenna we have to make the size of the antenna very small and we want to make, we're constrained to make the size and so we're going to use frequencies that tend to be a higher frequency and here, so seekers, missile seekers would tend to be uh, in this range now if we're interested in I call scorekeeping uh, that is having a, a set of radars which when a, ra a test of a of a uh, of a missile intercept or you want to uh, fly a missile and see how well it operated and you want 
you want to measure the characteristics of that missile at many different frequencies. The radars that do this are called range instrumentation radars. And here we see the set of range instrumentation radars that are out at Kwajalein on the Marshall Islands that are used to uh, measure the observables on targets, missiles that are fl uh, flown from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, test ICBMs are tested, US ICBMs are tested from Vandenberg into Kwajalein. And th this, you can see they cover the whole raft. Uh, the Altair radar back here is UHF and VHF. Uh, the tr this is the Tradex radar, which is at S at L band. Alcor is at C band. Uh, down in another part of the island is an X band radar. And uh, this is the millimeter wave radar which uh, operates at 35 and 95 gigahertz uh, frequency. So in range instrumentation radars cover the whole, the whole gamut of frequencies. Now I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the different ways we classify radars. There's all the kinds of ways that you can talk about. Uh, you know, you can say, oh, it's a ship-based ship radar. It's a... Uh, uh, and then you can talk about it by the platform, the waveform format, the, the, the waveform itself. Uh, and then there are these funny names, and I'll go over them in a little more detail. Or the, the characteristics of the technology used or its functionality, the mission it has, and the actual function of the radar itself. And um, these are, they can be a little bit confusing at times, but you, you'll learn in the course of, the, of this radar course what all these different things mean. Uh, when we discuss waveforms, by the end of it, you'll understand all those these what all these different words mean: a pulse CW waveform, a phase coded waveform. And when we talk about um, antennas, you'll learn the difference between a reflector and a hybrid scan or a, a phased array, also called electronically scanned arrays. And the f we've talked a little bit about the frequencies, whether the transmitter is solid state, by the f does it do uh, a functionality of its a synthetic aperture radar. Uh, and then also the mission. Uh, some civilian radars do air traffic control. They can also do air traffic control, of course, for the military, uh, controlling air traffic around airports that military uh, aircraft are. They can do air defense, ballistic missile defense. They can see into space. They can be airborne, giving the fleet early warning. Or they can be airborne and looking at ground moving target, uh, using moving target indication techniques we'll talk about. But then I want to focus mostly on, there are, there are names thought up by people. Uh, in this case, many of them either uh, who, uh, who the the uh, company that built the radar, some people in the Pentagon or whatever, so you don't want someone to know their functionality. Are the people uh, an acronym that could stand for a, a number of different things, like uh, uh, the PAWS actually here in this PAVE PAWS, which is a, a military designation. The pay, they're two word military designations that mean, that can just mean be random words, but the PAWS was chosen for phased array, array warning system. But anyway, the government also has a, a, a more rational system. And there's an ambiguity because some of these guys, uh, everybody has this military number. And one thing you notice is the middle uh, letter here is, is always a P. And I want to go over the code of this with you so you'll understand what this means. I'm going to do the code in a second, but I just want to point out that the paved pause radars, uh, one of which is in Cape Cod and the other is uh, out in the west coast at Beale Air Force Station, uh, they're called the FPS-115. The Cobra Dane radar up on uh, Shemya is the FPS-108. Uh, the Patriot uh, missile defense system, its radar, its phased array radar is the MPQ-53. Aegis is the SPY-1, and the Firefinder counter-battery radar is the TPQ-37. So each, all of these radars have, if they're a military system, have a, uh, uh, a designation of this form. 
Now the question is, how is this designation? How does it come about? And this is how you break the code. Uh, you can actually look this up on, it's on the web, but uh, before I think it appeared in Google, a lot of people would scratch their heads and say, what does it mean? And someone would hand them, you know, years ago, a, a Xerox of what this meant. Now the first letter uh, tells you how, what it's installed on. A is a piloted aircraft, F means it's fixed on the ground, and you can see I've highlighted in blue what radars would tended to be. Uh, uh, you wouldn't have a W because you wouldn't, you know, have a combined surface and undersurface system. Uh, but uh, you can see that the first letter tells you what it's installed on. The second letter tells you what it is, and of course the P of, would stand for radar. And the third tells you something general about its purpose. Uh, G being fire control or searchlight directing, Q special purpose accommodation, S meaning search, tracking, and Y surveillance. So this will this is the code. This is how you break the code. And just show you quickly with one or two examples. Uh, here we have a picture of the TPS 43, and the they're typically followed by an A N slash and then this code. So it's, it's a transportable radar, so it gets a T. I've highlighted over here for each of the cases. I'm going to show you the next two or three view graphs quickly. It, it's a radar, and it's used for detection uh, and or search and or range and bearing and search. It, so that's what the TPS-43 does. It's a search radar and tracks. And here's another, an FPS-16, which is an instrumentation radar used at many test ranges. And it's ground-based, it's a radar, and it also does uh, search and track. Uh, we go to ship-based radar, the SPY-1. It's a, a, sh a surface ship-based radar do doing surveillance and control, fire control and air control. Okay. And finally, uh, the MPQ-64, it's also more popularly actually known, I think, to people as the Sentinel radar. I think the, probably the Sentinel came out of the program office and then because every radar built by the military has to have one of these designation, it was the 64th MPQ that was built and, uh, and it's a special purpose or a combination of purposes. Sometimes people might put in the Q because they don't want you to know what it 